It is truly a blessing to be with you here in Bahrain. I shared with the search committee a few weeks ago that one of my favorite passages comes from Revelation 7. And in that text, uh, John writes that the multitude gathered before God and worshiped God, people from all nations and from all tribes and all languages. And it's great to gather with an assembly that approximates what we expect in the kingdom to come. But before I get started today with our message, let us pray. Lord God, let the words of your servant's mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, where I should not speak your words, intercept them, and replace them with yours. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our God. Amen. Today, I want to first address the passage from the Gospel of St. Luke, and then consider the message, the wider message, from our Hebrews passage. Our passage from Luke may be a more comfortable one for us to hear. On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues. A woman appeared who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. Imagine a woman crippled for 18 long years, and at this point, and perhaps for some time, unable to straighten herself at all. Jesus saw her, called her over, and said, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. He laid his hands upon her, and she immediately stood up straight and praised God. For 18 years, this woman had suffered perhaps ridicule, perhaps pain, perhaps without the ability to complete her daily routine as the other women around her could. And Jesus healed her and defeated the spirit that was within her. The healing was immediate and after 18 long years of suffering. A woman was healed and we rightly rejoice. She praised God. She accepted God after 18 years of a life that was very different. She might have rejected Jesus as such a tremendous change in her life would not have been easy. How would friends and family react to what she had now become? How would those who walked by her previously and scorned her react to her new circumstances? How would she adjust to a life that wasn't affected by her condition? A woman who would likely have been defined by her condition would have needed, would have found a new existence another image of herself, another way of describing herself to others. This woman, though, did adjust, and she accepted Jesus seemingly immediately. The leader of the synagogue, however, did not react so favorably. He was indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. He called out, there are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days and not on the Sabbath. Another English translation indicates the synagogue leader kept saying to the crowd these words as if he was calling them out again and again to the crowd. It's interesting to note that the synagogue leader said this to the crowd and not directly to Jesus, for it was Jesus who did the healing. And there's no evidence in the text that the woman requested the healing from Jesus. Perhaps the leader feared Jesus. Perhaps he feared the crowd would react against him if he rebuked the one who offered good news and healing, even on the Sabbath day. In reality, He rejected the healed and the healer. He rejected the woman and he rejected God at work and God's son. 
From where else could such a healing come to heal a woman crippled for 18 years in an instant? The synagogue leader might have thought it was a safer route to rebuke the crowd, but the outcome for him was not so favorable. Jesus rebuked him and the other leaders, pointing out they cared for their animals on the Sabbath. Why should not this woman be freed from bondage on the Sabbath after 18 long years of suffering? The crowd was delighted with all the wonderful things that Jesus was doing, but Jesus' opponents were humiliated. This is a passage we enjoy. A woman was healed and the oppressors were defeated, embarrassed, and humiliated. This represents the God that many of us know. The God of love who heals and who rebukes the oppressors. The people we don't like. This is God in a sense. Other passages of scripture, including one in chapter 12 and shortly before today's passage from Luke, are less comfortable. Let me remind you of Jesus' words there. I have come to bring fire on the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. Do you think I have come to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. From now on, there will be five in one family divided against each other, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. This is not the God with whom we may be comfortable a God who brings division. Again, this isn't a remote passage in Scripture. The story of the crippled woman who was healed appears in chapter 13. The verse where Jesus spoke of bringing division is a short few paragraphs earlier, near the end of chapter 12. Shortly after the story of the crippled woman, still in chapter 13, Jesus was asked, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? Jesus answered, Make every effort to enter through the narrow door, because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. The people left outside cry out, Sir, open the door for us. The answer given them will be, I don't know you or where you come from me, come from. Away from me, all you evildoers. This also may not be the God we enjoy hearing of. This is a sometimes divisive divisive God who doesn't show love to some who reject him when he comes disguised, but pursue him when he comes uncovered. There's a heresy that has long existed in the church that tries to reconcile these two perspectives of God. Some who pursue a very quick and selective reading of the Old Testament conclude that the God of the Old Testament is a God of wrath and anger and discipline. A similar rapid and selective reading of the New Testament has some conclude that the God of the New Testament is one of love and healing, and freedom. We've already considered in this message that the New Testament appears to have both of these gods present within a short couple of chapters. Likewise, a complete reading of the Old Testament would show a God who also has great concern for the oppressed, the enslaved, the immigrant, the widow, and the orphan, among many others. Even the two greatest commandments that Jesus names, to love God and to love neighbor, are first stated in the Old Testament. There are not two gods through Scripture, nor is there, God, there, nor is there a God that changes its very nature from wrath to love. 
There is one God. As scripture states, the Lord is God. Beside him there is no other. We risk making a similar error as we read today's passage from the book of Hebrews, located in the New Testament. This letter was written to the early church, very likely before 70 A.D. Earlier in the letter, the author indicates his concern his readers might fall away from their new faith in Jesus Christ, back into their former experience, whether as Jews or as pagans. The author describes two mountains. The first mountain is one that cannot be touched and that is burning with fire to darkness, gloom, and storm. Though not explicitly named, he describes, the, describes Mount Sinai found on the Sinai Peninsula of Egypt, but experienced by the Israelites during their Exodus journey. The Israelites had encamped around Mount Sinai. God called out to Moses from the mountain, promising that if the people would obey him fully and keep his covenant, then out of all nations they would be his treasured possession and people. They would be for God a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. In response, the people promised to do what the Lord had commanded. God commanded them to prepare for the third day when God would come down upon Mount Sinai before all the people. They were commanded not to touch the mountain, as anyone who was not invited who touched the mountain would be put to death. On that third day, there was thunder and lightning, a thick cloud upon the mountain, and a trumpet blast. The people trembled. The mountain shook. God then shared the Ten Commandments with Moses and the people. The people trembled and were afraid and asked Moses to be an intermediary between God and the people. Moses went up the mountain and received other laws with the stone tablets of the covenant. One might have thought that the people would have been scared to do anything outside of God's command. But during the long period Moses was on the mountain, the people made a golden calf and worshipped it. At Mount Sinai, the people rejected God. And this is what the author of Hebrews fears for his readers. The Israelites in the Exodus journey didn't experience the God they expected. Moses had taken absence too long, and they lost faith. They reached back to their former ways of worship, those from their bondage in Egypt. This is the mountain that cannot be touched and that is burning with fire to darkness, gloom, and storm. Even Moses trembled in fear. The second mountain, which is named in Hebrews, is Mount Zion. This is the mountain to which the readers have come. They have come to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem. They have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. They have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. This is the holy city to which you and I have access through the new covenant and through the blood of Jesus Christ. As God came down to earth in human form in Jesus Christ, was victorious over sin and death, paid the price for the sin of each of us, and reconciled each of us with God, we can now approach God. 
We have access to Mount Zion and do not have to tremble at Mount Sinai. This is a mountain with which we have many reasons to be comfortable and to celebrate. It is the heavenly Jerusalem, the city where angels are celebrating, the destination for all the saints, those before us in our time and after us, and the city where Jesus resides. The qualifiers, though, are important. It is the city of the righteous made perfect and the city of God the judge of all. Those who enter this city are first made perfect, first through Christ's righteousness, but also through sanctification. The author speaks a warning. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven. Against the synagogue leader in Luke, we need to make sure that we do not reject God's message. Against the Israelites at Mount Sinai, we need to make sure that we do not reject God's message. Rejection of God's message Rejection of Christ's message as they are one in the same is also to place a new message in its place. As the Israelites did at Mount Sinai, we must ensure we don't replace or taint God's message with the message of our various cultures. As the Israelites modified the focus of their worship and practice based upon their experience in Egypt, we must not modify the focus of our worship and practice based upon the message of the world in which we live in or the world from which we come. God is one. God is love. God is comfort. God is healing. God, however, is also disciplinarian, as Hebrews 12, verse 7 also notes. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children, for what children are not disciplined by their fathers? God is not what we nor the world project upon God. We would be wise to worship and follow God as he defines and reveals himself. Being sanctified, being made perfect, being made holy so that we can enter the presence of God is not easy. As with a dedicated athlete, it is often painful and sacrificial. It often requires great endurance. It sometimes goes against those around us who make claims or model what we should be doing. But our hope in Jesus Christ remains great. We look forward to a day when we will also be in the number of the righteous made perfect, entering the heavenly Jerusalem and entering the presence of of our Lord. We live in a world that will be shaken again by God as it was at Mount Sinai. In the time of Moses, God's voice shook the earth, but now God has promised Once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. God's promise continues that the things that can be shaken will be removed, so that what cannot be shaken will remain. We are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. The author of Hebrews commands us to be thankful and to worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. May we gather and worship regularly in reverence of God, in deep respect, but also in awe with both fear and wonder. 
May we not reject our God and his message, but may we have a godly fear and a wonder that draws us to understand who God truly is and what God's call to each of us truly is. May we be sanctified, be made holy, be made perfect in all of our remaining days. Let us not force God into our image of God or of love or of rules, but let us worship God and accept God as he reveals himself. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.